Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 604. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's June 16th, 2020. This is one of those longer episodes. Not for you guys. It's, it is for George and I because uh, we've had technical difficulties and we just had weed whacker and leaf blower difficulties. I think we now have a quiet studio and working computers. Oh, I so hope we do. Um, part of taping and kind of script is just the fun of uh, being on the cutting edge of technology where you can record this over the internet at two different places. George is in Florida, some 1800 miles away from me. And I press the record button and most days it works flawlessly. Today, we've had some flaws and noises. We're beyond that now, I hope. If you see me doing this, I'm making sure that I press the record button. It's, it's just a, a curious <laughs> panic I have. So George, before I get started, I always want to remind people, and I check my show notes, that we need to like, share, comment, subscribe, and if you want, please listen to the podcast. I do this every week because it helps promote the show. YouTube and Facebook and Google have algorithms where they see if something becomes popular, they promote it. And it's kind of like free advertising. I don't want to pay for advertising to Google or Facebook. That costs money and that's a horrible use of your donations. So if I can get free advertising through your clicks, I'm going to ask you to do that. Not to puff myself up, George. I mean, I, I'm a very humble character when you get to know me. How's your week going, George? Well, I am in a state of <laughs> wonder and joy. <laughs> and it's because I've had to pray a lot. Mm. Uh, things are going pretty, it's pretty dicey. No, no, that's not a good word. It's pretty rotten out there. Yeah. The country is in miserable shape. The Episcopal Church is in dreadful shape. My parishioners are have cavern fever, and so they're fighting over, some people are fighting over things that are just in a, not essential and unimportant, but they're, oh, Kevin, uh, I won't say it's as bad as condo board politics, oh. but it's bad. <laughs> people getting mad at uh, other people over things that, uh, we have a discrepancy in the finance committee. We have two accountants fighting as if blood is in the streets right now over how to account for a gift of stock. Every uh, jot and tittle must be accounted for. Yes. And so, <laughs> you know, the, 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 and it's, it's, it's broken down into accusations of bad faith and things. It just is so. So, what's the answer? Well, once upon a time when I was young and I've always been an American and my American Express card sometimes works, the answer was I could fix it through my strength and my ego or I could pay for it to go away. I've reached the point in my life where I must trust totally in Jesus Christ. And I can't fix 60 year olds behaving like six year olds. I, I have the same experience. I mean, I've raised three children. I know how children act. I know how to slowly take a child who's having an emotional breakdown. I know how to get them to relax and start to think or take a nap. <laughs> think with reason. I can do that. However, I'm on the condo board. I can't seem to get 60 year olds and 65 year olds to take a, a, a breath and step back and stop being so emotional. This COVID thing, this lockdown thing, this whole new newness that we're living into um, inside the church and outside the church is just craziness and uh, it, it it's hard to watch it's hard to live through but we're, we're called to live through this it, it's interesting we're, we're living in a time where nobody understands reconciliation again we're the church of course we understand reconciliation we were reconciled once two thousand years ago for all time and we just need to live into that. Ah, George, I wish times were simply, but they're not. But we're called to be Christians in complicated times and in simple times. And if you have any questions, email me. I'll explain how that works. Um, we had an email this week from a viewer who's an Episcopal priest in a diocese. I don't want to name the diocese. 
east of no west of Connecticut. There, that, that that'll give you the range. Obviously, so our Rhode Island viewers are safe. <laughs> that's that. right. So yeah, you're not from Rhode Island. So west of Connecticut, and he goes, Kevin. I think I'm a typical case study. I'm an Episcopal priest. I'm Orthodox Evangelical, but I'm in the Episcopal Church, and up until recently, things have been going pretty good. I've been able to grow my church, it's been healthy, I've been able to raise my family in this wonderful neighborhood, but now my bishop has gone hostile, and which is okay, but now they want to you know, impose things upon parishes that just weren't, we're not willing to do anymore. How do I find something else? How do I move to the ACNA? How do I find a different diocese within the Episcopal Church? What do I do? to move out from under an hostile bishop? It's a great question. Then he lists the things he wants to keep. And that's that makes it more difficult. I want to keep my pension. Who doesn't want to keep their pension? I, when, when the ACNA was about to form and people were being deposed in the Episcopal Church, the biggest concern a lot of clergy had is like, I'm 60 and I'm about to lose my pension by moving in the ACNA. That's, that's a hard, hard thing to swallow. I remember Bishop Duncan losing his pension after all those years of service. I'm like, that, that's hard. That's a sacrifice. And I said, well, this is something we can talk about on the show because George is an Episcopal priest. I don't know if you're fully vested in the pension plan yet, but I think you understand the sacrifices that you may one day have to make if your bishop becomes hostile. Now, you're under Greg Burrell, Brewer, not a hostile bishop, probably one of the three remaining safe bishops in the Episcopal Church. I'm thinking Albany, Dallas, Central Florida. If you were under maybe a Charles Benison, things would be a little different for you. I once was under oh, Charles Benison. That's right. ah. And that's what brought that's what moved me to Central Florida by a roundabout way. <laughs> the uh, well I would, if under Benison, I would not have been permitted to write, to have a public voice. Mm -hmm. uh, all of my writing over the years, this this show itself would have been forbidden. Bishop Benison was a believer in uh, free speech for me, but not for thee. Uh, Bishop Benison would write was notorious for writing these diocesan letters in the newspaper, diocesan newspaper, and I remember one when I was in seminary where he uh, basically said, oh, and it was an Easter letter, and he recounted how Jesus was a sinner just like you and me. Whoa. Now, even though I was a sinner and I hadn't gotten my degree yet, I sort of knew there was something not right with that. Uh, but the, uh, the situation you described of uh, the writer is one that I think is shared by hundreds upon hundreds of Episcopal clergy, where for the most part, they've been able to prosper in their settings. Their churches are happy places. They're doing well. but And we've gone through the d distresses over the past 10 plus years. And they were not in dioceses where it was made an immediate issue. Right. That was my situation. Um, I've been called to minister among a group of people. And I've been, been relatively successful at it. And I've got five, six hundred people for whom I provide spiritual and pastoral and liturgical support and worship. Um, why wreck that? Because I disagree with things farther up the food chain when their influences, apart from having the word Episcopal on the store and using the Episcopal Book of Common Prayer and dressing like I'm in the union, you know, you, you, the, my church has so little in common in what the message that that the sort of the mainstream of the Episcopal Church has right now. Why worry about it? Yeah. But now we're in a world where we have Bishop Love being actively persecuted, where we're seeing the cancel culture of the world percolate into the Episcopal Church in a massive way, and so people who, yeah, I have a great deal of empathy. I don't want to move my children out of their schools. My wife has a good job and we need her income. Uh, my parish is happy and 
why do I want to wreck everything? We don't have a million dollars in the bank to gauge in a lawsuit that depending upon which state we're in, we may win or we may lose. Mm -hmm. What do I do? Well, you basically run out the clock. Just, you know, realize that you've reached the heights of your career ambitions. And for many of us, if you're like in a normal American, we're all careerists in some sense. And that's a little disappointing to hear that you're never going to be top dog. You run out the clock, stay where you are, keep the bishop far away, don't talk about what the craziness, don't share the bishop's messages, and people will be born, they'll die, they'll go through confirmation class, and every so often they'll come to you and say, what is this, I read the newspaper. And you'll do what I did, have done over the years, is, God, don't worry about that, that's <laughs> that. <Don't> do that. <laughs> that's that. That's a different you know, brand of Episcopal. <laughs> that, you know, yeah, you know, don't worry. Second, you can join uh, uh, the Anglican Church in North America or mm -hmm. some of the other uh, continuing churches, but then you have the immediate financial prospect of you're not going to be able to have the financial support if you stay in the same place. Right. You're not going to have the finances uh, that you once had. That's just the facts of life. And if you try to take your parish with you, the Episcopal Church will go after you personally. And unless you're independently wealthy, you couldn't easily be bankrupted. You could easily, you know, not be able to afford your children's college tuitions. You'd not be able to keep, maintain your house. It's a battle that you have to decide, is that what you went to fight? And then you have the phenomena that we see in Central Florida. In the last year, we've had three ACNA priests become rectors here. Um, in fact, I, uh, the Bruss just went to Central Florida, Ellis and uh, Cindy. Ellis and Cynthia Brust. Ellis mm -hmm. was one of the sort of founders of the uh, ACNA through the AMIA, and uh, mm -hmm. his wife Cynthia was their press officer for many years. Mm -hmm. Alice Brust accepted a call as the rector of St. Andrew's Episcopal Church in Fort Pierce, and Cynthia of Hope Episcopal Church in Melbourne. So he's going to be received back into the Episcopal Church. Yeah. yeah I mean, it, wow. And, you know, the St. Andrew's is a, is a moderately well-off, uh, Fort Pierce is not the nicest place, but mm -hmm. it's the church where the, the old Floridian, the guys who own 100,000 acre cattle ranches come sure. to church on Sunday. Oh, that's so it, it's, uh, it's, it's not a sacrifice by mm -hmm. any means. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have people from outside, you know, people, and then we, I've, I've friends who have asked me, can you help me find a job? Uh, it's not so much, can you help me find a job, but let me know if there's an opening. And there's a wonderful woman who moved to the Diocese of Central Florida from the Diocese of Springfield to be a rector. Um, and there are other people who try to get here because it's a safe place. Now, one of the problems is not every church is a church that you would envision being in Florida. We're not all on the beaches. We don't all have retiree congregations. We have a lot of poor, rural, working class church, just like every other diocese. And, and so people, when they move here, more often than not, have to take a drop in the type of church. So from a suburban church in Philadelphia, New York, Chicago, to come to, Flo come to Central Florida, you're moving into a church that has beautiful tiff. You may have beautiful Tiffany windows and wonderful stonework into a church where the air conditioning smells like molding. You have a tin roof and across the street's a trailer park. Uh, you know. But so that's God is- That's Florida, you know. At God is worship, God be praised because yeah. Bethesda by the Sea in Palm Beach has got a lot of people wanting to be rector there. <laughs> and recent, and their new rector swallowed the Kool-Aid too, so that's no longer a good place, but that's a different diocese. But the, different, the yeah. point is, it's a, it's a real phenomenon. Where do you go? What do you do? And I don't know the answer. No. Um, it's, it's up to, where, where is God calling you? And how do you, you know, do you wait until you've timed out in the Episcopal Church and then go start a uh, parish for the uh, ACNA, or do you stay within? And John Stott's advice to people in the Church of England uh, until his death about a year or two ago Maybe was to couple, stay more, in more than that, but yeah, it was five years ago. Well, I, oh, that's I, all right. He, he, he still is a presence in my mind. 
That's fine. His advice, and the issue hasn't changed. Yeah. His advice was to stay where you are and fight the good fight. And that advice is holds true for the Episcopal Church. It's not, but every every man, every woman has to decide where their conscience lies on this point. Indeed. And I bring this up again because you and I are going to talk about the Bishop Love trial. Bishop Love in the realm of Christendom in the kingdom has done nothing wrong. He has done exactly as scripture says. He has been a perfect bishop. He was a perfect clergyman before that. Outstanding above reproach. He was brought up on charges by uh, the Episcopal Church. By because, clergy in his diocese. By, I'm sorry, by the clergy in his diocese because he would not allow them to perform same-sex marriages. Mm -hmm. And that trial was on Friday. And I can't believe we're bringing up a Christian man, a bishop, on trial for this. It Well, it was on bro broadcast via Facebook Live. Zoom, yeah. Well, it was on Zoom for the participants. Okay. And then you could watch but not uh, speak mm -hmm. via Facebook Live. And there was not, and it was actually at the same time as our Friday morning broadcast. But I did catch a few minutes of it. And it was, as I expected, nothing more than a rehash of the pleadings. And if you'd like to read the pleadings, just go to Anglican Inc. and look at the love story, and you'll find a link to the website where the uh, motions, there were motion for summary judgment by both the church attorney on behalf of prosecuting and Bishop Love's attorney defending. And we talked about what those issues were. Alan Haley has an article on Anglican Inc. this morning where he talks not so much about the trial issues, but how it got to this point and the utter ridiculousness of the whole matter. But Bishop Love is, if it were a fair and just trial, he would be acquitted honorably. Yeah, absolutely. But one of the things Alan Haley pointed out is that we have this anomaly of the judge, if you will, is Bishop Nick Nicely of Rhode Island, who I've met and who I think is a lovely, splendid man. He's very liberal, but he's a decent, honorable fellow who wants the good. He just has a different worldview. He's also the author, co-author of the resolution Bishop Love is accused of violating. So well, he's both on. the victim it, that, that and the judge. That can't be. That's... I forget the term we use for that, but that's uh, not, you're not supposed to be able to judge on stuff where you're involved. Well, tell mm -hmm. that the Episcopal Conflict Supreme Court. Conflict of interest. Yes, yeah, sorry. The <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. State South of South Carolina, Carolina <laughs> Supreme Court. You've got a judge whose husband is an activist, who's an active member of the Episcopal Church in South Carolina, yeah. uh, basically parroting the national church's arguments, and she's judging the case. So. Hmm. What, how could we possibly complain about the love trial when the Supreme Court of South Carolina decides it doesn't, you know, conflict of interest isn't an issue. Yeah. But yeah. so, you know, it's a fool's game to bet on the outcome. Now, from if you want to play political insider baseball, the political insider baseball is he'll be acquitted. But you'll get such a muddy decision that it's only pertinent to Bishop Love and we'll find a technicality. Uh, okay, this was not filed on the correct date. It's 20 minutes late. The reason why Michael Curry doesn't want to force the issue. Mm -hmm. Michael Curry does not want to go into the next Lambeth conference and have the Episcopal Church be the issue again. And if Bill Love is stripped of his Episcopal authority for upholding the Book of Common Prayer as it currently stands, Read Alan Haley's article if you really want to understand what's going on. If Bill Love is going to be persecuted for not bowing to the political whims of the mob, Michael Curry needs to act, and Nick Nicely needs to give a decision that satisfies the partisans who want Bishop Love's head, but preserves the Episcopal Church's place in the wider communion. I can't imagine how it would look to Michael Curry if... Um, Bishop Love had penned a letter asking Archbishop Justin Welby for depot. You know, help oversee me because I'm being persecuted for upholding the Book of Common Prayer in my province. Well, here's the, here's the kicker about Justin Welby. Hmm. Under George Carey, George Carey would have done it. Yeah. Under Rowan Williams, 
we have famous correspondence between John Howe and, and Rowan yeah. Williams, which we have published on Anglican Inc. Go into the archives, where Rowan Williams says the primary instrument of communion is the diocese, not the national church. So that you, John Howe, and are can still be in communion with me, even if you are, even if you think of uh, breaking with the Episcopal Church. Justin Welby, who was brought in as the great evangelical hope against the liberal woolly Rowan Williams and the uh, methodical George Carey, Justin Welby has been such a disappointment that you know he. Well, I don't want to make this the Justin Welby show, but <laughs> it was he, just he, 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 he will not, even when we have agreement, he, he will not honor primates meetings, commitments to do this about the Episcopal Church. He will not honor any of this stuff. They'll find a way to fudge it. So if Bill Love reached out to Justin Welby, it's like reaching out to a wet noodle. I mean, it's not going to support you. But at the same token, that inability, that lack of spine, that lack of internal compass, that desire to smooth and smother things over and kick the can down the road, actually is helpful for Bill Love in the legal sense because Welby doesn't want to have an issue that will alienate the global south. Mm -hmm. He's already lost GAFCON and he wants to be able to preser preserve the global south's loyalty. But if Bishop Love gets hammered for being faithful Christian, being a innocent sacrificial lamb for the rages of the crazies in the Episcopal Church. It's bad news internationally. Yeah, yeah well, well, let's just see what happens. I, I'm surprised. I mean, it's 2020. Uh, are they going to have a general convention next year? No, it's been canceled, though, hasn't it? The general convention is postponed. Yeah. Uh, Next year's 2021 General Convention, which was to be in Baltimore, yeah. has been postponed. And the public reasons are the COVID-19. And I think that may be true on certain levels because the General Convention is a collection of geriatrics, uh, the deputies, you don't want them there, yeah. <laughs> with, yeah. with a few crazy, uh, you get the Looney Tunes there as well, crazy kids who they're now all, all going to be in Seattle this year, so they may not come to General Convention. But the, the second is the Episcopal Church, uh, it's a multi-million dollar extravaganza, and bishops send uh, eight people, four clergy, four deputies, plus their bishops for a week. Baltimore is not a cheap city. Not cheap at all. And it's enough, but yeah, not cheap. It's not, a, and the Episcopal Church insists on only holding it in union venues, so mm -hmm. they're not getting any they're not going to be at the Marriott, I think. And the COVID-19 has just destroyed diocesan cash flow. So well, these that, people I mean, aren't going to have the money to do this. I, I've heard churches, I don't know if your church, but uh, many dioceses said, don't send money until this is over. You know, we're forgiving you three, four months worth of uh, assessment. Um, well, it, 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 it. they're saying don't send money now. No. It's the forgiveness part <laughs> that is being left unsaid. Ah, see, yeah, I made that up. I didn't hear forgiveness. So I, just, I see what you're saying there. So, it does. so <laughs> And it's like this PPP money. Our, mm -hmm. our, best, our church is debating whether we accept it because the strings, if you really read the fine print, the strings are such that, uh, you know, what is three, you know, two months salary for me and the secretary, is it worth having the government in your no. face oh, no. so we have to figure and fortunately we're we we have several months cash on hand even before all this so it's not a we're not against the wall like most episcopal churches are who don't have uh, trusts yeah i think at our our vestry uh, meeting it was a, a 20 second 30 second topic that nah we don't want that <laughs> we don't want we don't want uncle sam any you know, in control of our purse strings. Well, interesting show. We finally got one recorded. What's this, our second or third take? I'm glad we, we finally got one done. Um, and here's the thing. We're going to be doing Tuesdays and Fridays uh, recording because the difficulty is you have staff meeting via Zoom every Monday. 
By the time you're done with that, by the time I'm done with my Monday emergencies, we're both brain dead. It's not worth listening to us on a Monday. And then we do Fridays. And Fridays is a good cleanup for all the week of news. So please pay attention then. How do we get to know when the new show comes out? You got to subscribe. Go to YouTube, subscribe. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 604 of Anglican Unscripted.